Okay, it's about five minutes after. I want to read a couple of passages of Scripture, or actually a passage of Scripture, if, if I could have your attention. I'm, 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 in, I'm starting now, ladies. Ladies, I'm starting now. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to read from, from the Sermon on the Mount. I'd like to read a passage uh, from Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23. This is, this is Jesus speaking because the letters are in red. But I think that all the Bible passages should be read. Uh, <laughs> all right. It, it's Jesus actually speaking. He's teaching. He says, Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's law. This is a perfect passage for us to enter into and talk about the Gospels. So I want to pray, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about this passage, and then we'll get into at first glance. Okay, let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you that your word is mysterious and hard at times, hard to understand sometimes, and, and hard on us. It's hard on us to follow uh, because of how much it asks of us. Thank you that it does all those things that you are a God that wants us in your family, that you promise to work in our midst, that you are the faithful one even when we are unfaithful. Father, we've walked through these doors. We're broken people. We don't know what we're doing sometimes. The, the road is difficult. And yet you are so good. We thank you that the tomb was empty. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. So what could this passage possibly mean? How can someone, Jesus says, do miracles in his name and not be his? Doesn't that sound frustrating? How do we, how do we interpret this? How do we understand this? How do we walk along with this truth? The Bible should be simple. We're Christians here. Shouldn't we understand it immediately? Shouldn't it be easy? <laughs> well, I think it will be one day. <laughs> but uh, let's talk about at first glance, we think, well, this is Jesus. We're, we're getting snapshots of Jesus. Shouldn't it be an easy thing to understand what the scriptures are saying, especially when Jesus is teaching? Wouldn't he want it to be uh, everything should be a prima facie case where at first glance and at first look we should understand it and it should be intuited but in fact it's not at first glance maybe we would think so but our, our chapter does I think a pretty good job of saying there is complexity here there, there are issues that we need to understand that there are um, unique pieces of this part of the scriptures known as the Gospels. They are unique. They are not like anything else that we have in the scriptures. Um, we don't have uh, an analogous uh, understanding of narrative like the Gospels. Much like Acts kind of is its own sort of narrative, the reason the Gospels are being kind of pulled uh, apart and, and are dealt with in their own chapter is because it's actually tricky to under, understand the Gospels. Uh, and we're going to talk about a little bit more uh, why that is and the nature of the Gospels here, but let's just admit that we can be a little bit um, led astray by our own maybe not careful looking at Scripture. Have, have you been the recipient of not so careful teaching before. I believe, so. I believe I have too. 
I've, I think I've walked along with a belief system that was more about church tradition than it was about good exegesis and good hermeneutic. I say this every week, but I want us to land in the Gospels and, and wrestle with the genre that is, the, 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 the kind of um, literature that the Gospels are, so that we would come out the other side better handling what the Gospels really are and how to understand them. And the Lord saw fit to tell us about himself, Jesus, I mean, the Lord Jesus, through the Gospels. And this is where we want to talk about the nature of the Gospels, right? There's a particular nature of the Gospels. And the, the, the particular nature of them is that none of the authors of the Gospels that are talking uh, you know, in regards to Jesus are Jesus himself, right? So it, none of these Gospels are a book by Jesus. They're all books about Jesus, which kind of puts a little bit of a, a twist on it for us. I think that little truth, that the Gospels are books about Jesus, we need to keep in mind. Because it helps us think a little differently about what we're reading. And when we, when we encounter this passage of Scripture, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. That's an ouch. Does that step on your toes a little bit? You know, Jesus is teaching a, a, a better understanding of how the Jews should have interacted with the law. They, they thought, the Jews thought that legalism and doing the things that the Bible said was what the, the, the law was all about. And Jesus basically systematically teaches that it's about the heart not doing the law to the letter of the law, right? So the, the Pharisees um, spent a lot of time adding laws outside of the law so that you don't break the law. So, I mean, there's, there's um, the, the, the laws that you have within the Old Testament, but then they put laws outside of that, and then they put more laws outside of that. So basically, that there was a buffer zone for you that you would never break the law. Pharisees thought it was all about the letter of the law, right? So they added, um, you shouldn't take more than three steps in a row on the Sabbath. Because if you do, then you're doing work. You should never walk across your lawn. This is actually a law they had. Don't walk across any grass, because if you break a blade of grass, you've done work. You've effectively mowed the lawn, albeit one blade of grass that you broke. This is the kind of minutia, the tiny, tiniest rules that they put outside of the law to try and not break it. That's the wrong idea. They're starting from the outside in, where, where Jesus is trying to tell them this is an, Christianity is an inside job. That same principle Jesus is operating on when it says, there are many who will say, Lord, Lord, and he'll say, I'll depart from you, for I never knew you. They thought it was about looking like a Christian, acting like a Christian, when your heart really never got transformed. And doing things that the gospel says are Christianly things, Christ-like things, but from the wrong motivation. So Jesus is here in the Sermon on the Mount talking about the very same thing. Look, you don't understand. You think you're with me, but your hearts are far from me. Right? And, and so we could... We could misinterpret this passage by not understanding the kind of uh, literature that the Gospels are, right? And maybe you've already heard that passage, you've gotten there and said, well, I understand it, but I just wanted to take one little passage and kind of at the front end talk about this and go, well, the Gospels are a little different. We have to be careful, and how do we understand them is uh, to understand their nature, right? So there are books... Um, now, Jesus said those things that we just read, but it wasn't like Jesus wrote them down in the book of Matthew for Matthew. But Ma Matthew was, was um, writing down accounts that he was aware of, right? So, so that they're, they're um, not penned by Jesus. The second nature of the Gospels is that there are how many of them? 
there are four of them. And you just got to wonder, why four? Why not 17? Why not one? And, and, and the answer that I think the book really does is that this is how God chose to, to relate who Jesus is and how we are supposed to be and what does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to be a, a follower of Jesus? How, you know, uh, through the, the, the four Gospels. And uh, it, it used big terms, right? There's three, three of the Gospels are the same, or similar, I should say. They're not the same. Sorry, take that back. They're similar. They use very similar wording. And those are all known as the synoptic Gospels. Synoptic is a fancy word that says they're really similar. Uh, and, and I think theologians like to feel important and use big words. Um, I feel important when I use big words. I like big words. I like words. I, I bask. I enjoy. I favor using a large vocabulary because I have one. But I don't want you to get hung up on vocabulary. Synoptic just means three of them are a whole lot alike. And it's easy once you start reading through the Gospels to tell which ones are. And then there's this one crazy weird outlier one that, you know, churches should never study. Just kidding. We're just about to finish the crazy one, which is John. We're, we're about to finish a study that has lasted, um, I think, 50 weeks. And, and I think we've only scratched the surface with John. It's, it's been rich because of, uh, of John's take on it. And he's different. He's weird right? When you look at similarities, he only, you know, uh, shares about, what was it, like eight words or eight, eight uh, similar word usages in the one passage that was cited, where Matthew, Mark, and Luke hold like 58 or 56 words in some, you know, similarly in the same story. And it was like, they, they have, uh, clearly, the Matthew, Mark, and Luke have the same sort of basic information that they're working from, and John is, is working from a different, a different uh, place. And so the, the fact that there are four Gospels, this is the way that God gave us of knowing who Jesus is. It's the primary source of knowing who Jesus is from a literature standpoint. I mean, after we become a Christian, I would say that we get to know who Jesus is from our personal experience of him. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm saying that we experience the risen Savior at work in our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit. But to know, you know, literature, to use literature, it's, it's the Gospels and that's it, right? So, so it's a very, by nature, a very weird uh, genre of, of literature. And then the third aspect is the historical context. And this is where... It, did anyone get really like, whoa, I'm swimming hard on this section, right? I'm swimming hard. There's, there's a, a vertical aspect, right? Um, let me write that in blue. So there's, there's the vertical context, and there's the horizontal. The vertical and the horizontal. And, and that um, really kind of comes out of the... Uh, the idea that the vertical being there's two levels of historical context in the vertical. Did we remember, do you remember that? Like the vertical has, has the context of Jesus and then the, t the context of the writer. So you have a pretty, I mean, that gets deep, right? So how do you, how do you see those two? Because the vertical splits off into Jesus context and then the writer or author So, obviously, we know who the Jesus context is. The author is Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. And I think that this is the most difficult because we are who we are. When you think of telling someone a story about someone in history, we think of a history book. The best the way I can say about this, this vertical piece and even the horizontal piece, is that the Gospels are not a, a, an historical text. They're not a history book with regard to the way we write them in the West. Okay, The closest we come to that is probably Luke. 
he tries to follow chronology, and he's the closest to an actual, what we would think of as a historian, but even he's not a historian. So every one of the gospel writers, as they write, is not interested in chronology. Th that's not their main goal. Ultimately, they're, they're willing to meander around chronology and, and have it out of order historically so that they can tell you what they need to tell you. Um, they're more interested in, in uh, you coming away with an understanding that they want you to come away with than they are about what came first and then that and then the next and then the next. The problem that you and I have, as soon as I've said that, you felt it in your spirit. You're like, wait, but we need to know what came first. You know, did he call the disciples? How many times did he call the disciples? When you read the Gospels, it seems like he called them like three or four times. The answer is yes, I think he did. But which one of those callings is, is Matthew talking about when he's saying, hey, you know, forget those, what, what you're doing now, come follow me. What's Luke mean when he's, you know, it, it comes at different, in different places. The fact of the matter is, when a rabbi would go around and call someone, sometimes there were multiple callings. Like they would follow for a little bit, and then they'd go back to their life, and then he'd say, hey, hey, all right, right, time to come follow me again. That may be exactly what we're seeing in the Gospels. But that's the, more of the historical context of when Jesus was talking and how he did it. That's the vertical level where, like, did Jesus call the disciples multiple times? Right? Most of what I see is as challenges to, or, or are called contradictions within the gospel, is actually a fundamental misunderstanding of what a biblical gospel is. And it's trying to take the sensibilities that we have from the West about a history book and push that onto the Bible. And make arguments from the fact that it's a history book from a Western mentality. When that's not what it's really doing. Like that's where we have to talk about the writer as a part of this vertical. They are crafting in a way to leave you with an understanding. And we read in the, in the pages, right, that Matthew kind of comes at it from a different way. I mean, he's, he's writing to um, Gentile audience, but Jewish Gentile, I think. And Luke is a different take. John, you remember, John has a totally different take. And Mark, man, I think, I think Mark had a chip on his shoulder. <laughs> I think he did, because you read Mark, and... And he's almost like, and I think I said this once before, I would subtitle the book of Mark, Those Idiot Disciples. They're idiots. Look at, read Mark. I, loved, I love somebody who's a new believer or is, is considering Christ. I want them to read Mark first, not John. <gasps> Sacrilege. I want, I want, you know why? Because 16 chapters is easy to sit down and read in one shot. And it's not as weird as John. John's weird. He's got... He's got some wild things going on in there. I want somebody to sit down and read Mark because one of the things you get when you read Mark, it's just like the Old Testament. You know, what, was, what kind of man was Abraham? What kind of man was Isaac? What kind of man was Jacob? Man, they were mess-ups. They, they belonged with us. They they fit right in with us as living on the island of misfit toys. And I think God, being as powerful as he is, works within a misfit culture because after Genesis 1 and 2, that's what you have. The brokenness of sin creates a misfit nature with, with humans. And, boy, I tell you what, this, this, uh, this take that Mark has... You're, the disciples are just messing it up all over the place. I think that's one of his agendas, is to try and demystify or, you know, break down the... Well, you know what, what he's trying to do? He's trying to take the pastor and take him off of the pedestal that the Western church puts their pastors on. Uh, 25, 30 years of ministry, one of the things... My wife will tell you the same thing is true. I try to... to deconstruct anybody's trying to put me on a pedestal because 
I actually mess up all the time. In fact, I'll stand in front of a class and teach with my fly open the entire time. <laughs> Apparently, that's a theme in this church. I mean, I, before I started teaching, I was like, uh, are we okay? Yes, yes, we're fine. I don't, I just don't, I don't get it all right. I don't, I don't, I don't have all the answers, but I'm willing to look. That's the take that Mark wants, I think. That's part of, part of his agenda is to sh- demystify the disciples. And, uh, and, and so every one of the gospel writers, particularly Matthew, Mark, and Luke are easy to see. That they're, they're, you know, they're all, one of the similarities we, we hear about those three, the synoptic gospels, they're all basically based in which, which area of the world? No. Galilee. The majority of their writings are, are happening in Galilee. And I think the, the, what the author started to talk about, why they're in Galilee, is because they're writing for a gospel that is spreading. It's moving outside of Jerusalem. John is interested in Jerusalem. Everything you see, the majority, uh, I should say the majority of what you see in John, he has happening in and around Jerusalem. Very interesting to me. It's fascinating, in fact, to me. I'm wired that way, I get it. It doesn't have to fascinate you. But it's really cool. And the reason I say that is because the nature of the Gospels is exactly how God wanted it. That's important for us to understand. It's not there to confuse us. It's there to challenge us and to relate who Jesus wants us to be and how to be like him, right? And as we do this vertical context, we're asking the question, what is the ax to grind by the author? What ax does, does Matthew have? What's he, not, not in a negative way, but what is he, about Jesus, how, what is he trying to relate to me by the way he's crafting his, his stories? Because that's what a gospel is. It's pulling together the stories about Jesus in a particular way. Um, I'll give you a, a, a little, I'll use John as another example of this crafting, okay? This last week in church, we looked at two of the disciples who were following Jesus interacting with doubt first we saw mary and then we saw john and peter right and mary goes to the tomb she doesn't see the the body there so she's like oh my goodness somebody's stolen the body and and she goes back and says somebody stole the body john and peter run John is obviously fleeter afoot, gets there first, stops outside the, the grave. Peter hoof, 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 just chugs right inside the grave. Just, just totally Peter. I mean, he's so headstrong. And he runs in there. So John sees that there's no body, and then he says about himself, I believed. He doesn't say I believe, but the, the beloved disciple believed. All he had to see was an empty tomb, and he knew exactly what that meant. Mary, that wasn't enough. She had to see Jesus. Right? The disciples are all hiding out. This is this, is this week. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be stealing. Is David around anywhere? I'm stealing some thunder. Don't tell him I said this. But then the disciples are all hiding in, in the, the upper room, let's say. Suddenly Jesus is in their midst. Amazing, I love that, that resurrected body. I can't wait to have a resurrected body. That means you can move around like that. But anyway, I, so he's in their midst. And what does he say? Jesus says to them, they're freaked out. Fear has gripped them. He says, see my wounds. All the disciples had to do was see his wounds, and then they believed. But then Thomas wasn't with them. And he's like, Ah, uh, hey, hey, you saw Jesus. And Mary, you saw Jesus. You know, I mean, he's really a skeptic. Thomas is a skeptic. And unless I put my hands in his wounds, I won't believe. Jesus appears to him and says, Thomas, put your hands here. My Lord and my God, Thomas says. He didn't need to see. He needed to experience the wounds to believe. 
Do you think that were, those were all the appearances? Why is John selecting those? Particular uh, instances of appearances of Jesus. Why would he select those? Because there, we know there are more, right? And there's several days in between. We know it was like eight days between the disciples seeing him and Thomas. Eight days later, the text says. Man, it tells me that I have a Savior that's willing to go to whatever extent my doubt has taken me to reach me for belief, for faith. See, all, all, all uh, John had to do was see that the tomb was empty. Mary had to see Jesus. The disciples had to see the wounds. Thomas had to experience the wounds. And Jesus was all about it every step of the way. That is John's axe to grind that he gives us in John chapter 20, verse what? 30. One. Please tell me you guys know that passage, right? That's where he tells us what his, his gospel is all about, so that you might believe. He, he wants us to believe. And he's selecting those appearances to build a case so that you would believe. And, and, and if you're paying attention to the gospel, you're going, wait a minute, why is he... We should ask those questions. Why did he choose those? Why did he choose those four instances? And, and it's... One of the things that I take away from it, doubt is normal. Doubt is normal. Normal, normal, normal. If you think you're doubting and that's a wrong thing, you're thinking wrong. Doubt is a normal thing. God is able to shoulder your doubt, no matter how deep that doubt runs. If you're a Thomas or if you're a John, on either end of that spectrum that John lays out for us, Jesus is, is all about it. And so that is the axe to grind by John. So we have to understand that there is, and as far as the writer and the, the context of which Jesus is being uh, shown us, both of those historical contexts are the vertical side of things. And then the horizontal is the coolest, oh my goodness, the horizontal. We have four Gospels to look at, you know? Um, I put this out on our resources page. I brought the hard copy with me. This is one of all the resources that you get if you're going to be in the Gospels at all. The NIV Harmony of the Gospels. This helps you to horizontally look at a, a, a story right? So what this does is it chronologically, as best we can tell, from the beginning of Jesus' life to the end of his, to the ascension, puts the Gospels in chronological order. So what you'll see is in the, in the beginning of the book, all the early stuff. And whenever anything happens uh, in Jesus' life, that it, it um, follows and, and takes and shows you what each one of the Gospels has about that instance or that story. Um, I need to grab my glasses because I cannot see. So this is the call of Matthew. Um, and it shows the, the calling of Matthew it call, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. All three of them have um, Matthew's calling within their, uh, their uh, texts. Matthew 9.9, 9, Mark 2, and Luke 5. And it gives you all of those instances in those three books all together. So like here's Matthew 9, 9, here's Mark, and here's Luke. And it shows you the text in the NIV what those texts say. And so when you're looking at the calling of, let's say you're in the book of Matthew and you're studying it. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. That's Matthew's account of his own calling. Second one, out of Mark. Once again, Jesus went outside, out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. There's a little more information, isn't there? Luke, after this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi, sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. That tells you a little more about that instance, does it not? We know better about where the location was. It was beside 
the, the lake. There was a large crowd there. So this calling of Matthew was within the context of his teaching ministry. He had drawn a great crowd. But if you only read Matthew, you would have thought, well, he just came up to Matthew and said, Matthew, come, come follow me. And that was it. But that, Mark says, no, it was a part of a larger teaching thing. Sees Matthew, calls him. And then Luke adds, what? He left everything. For a tax collector, that's a big deal. You get this fuller sense of, wait a minute, this guy's walking away from his former life. I mean, you've watched The Chosen maybe, and you're like, hey, yeah, I get it. I, he, he, he really rejected his previous life and walked, walked after Jesus in a way that cost him everything. Uh, but as far as the gospel, looking at it horizontally means you're looking at what all the texts say about that particular instance. If we went to the feeding of the 5,000, that's one that's in all four Gospels. And you would find John listed there as well. But since John is so weird, chronologically you'll see just John in several of these pages is because he's, he's dealing with things that none of the other Gospels deal with. Right? Weird meaning he's different. If you're weird, be weird. <laughs> For Jesus. <laughs> because there's nothing wrong with it. Um, and, and that's, I, I just love that about the Gospels. So, and if, as we look horizontally, we get a broader perspective of any given moment within the life and ministry of Jesus, right? And so uh, this, this horizontal level is exciting to me. And, and I went to the vertical because that's kind of, that's hard to get, kind of get your head around, I think. Did, did, I, did I leave you behind with the vertical side of things? Or did you kind of follow it? Because I thought the book didn't do quite as good a job talking about the vertical. And, and you know, you want to consider vertically meaning, okay, there's two levels of historical context. There's the story that we're hearing about Jesus, but then there's the author who's placed it where he's placed it and shared what he's shared and oriented it where he wanted to orient it. And um, order matters. I think that wasn't real clear either. The order of things matters. So like when an author is trying to tell you and has about his particular axe to grind, they put things in different locations because they want to pull things out differently. Uh, one of the little idiosyncrasies about Greek, you know, because the book says, hey, look, Jesus' teachings were all in Aramaic, but we're reading them all in Greek. And so when you see Jesus teaching, pay attention to where the Greek places certain things. Because word order doesn't matter. You can have sentences that start with the predicate and then end with a verb. And then you have nominatives scattered throughout. It's very strange. Word order doesn't matter, but it does. Because you can put something at the end of a sentence that you want emphasized. Or you put it at the beginning of the sentence. And it may not be the verb, or maybe it is the verb. You want to emphasize whatever the verb is. It's a command, maybe. And you want to, you want to um, emphasize it, like pick up your cross. You know, you have that at the beginning, the verb at the beginning of the, the Greek sentence there, because you want to, someone to understand there's a, there's a picking up that is daily. It's ongoing. It's constant. It's never something that you're done with. Picking up is the, is the verb tense that is ongoing and never fully accomplished. And you have it at the beginning of the sentence because you really want someone to focus in on that fact. Because you're using Greek, you can do that. Honestly, I think that's part of why the Lord used Greek. Because of its malleability or flexibility with order of sentences. And you can use it to emphasize different ways. And so... Um, the, each gospel writer is not only placing stories in an order that they want, but they're even using wording in order that they want. Apart from the ones where they all agree, right? Which is the other nature, probably, that, that, that um, the context that it, he goes into, that Mark was probably written first. And then the other two had copies of Mark and used Mark as the basis the central uh, structure of their gospel. But then they had these other sayings 
and, and known um, accounts of Jesus that they used as well. Because there are parts that only Matthew and Luke agree, and it's not even in Mark. But their wording is exact, and that doesn't happen without having common original teachings that they're working from. So they, they are using things that are known within the Christian kingdom at that time. They're using these stories about Jesus that are either written down or orally. They're being told in such a way that you remember them. And, and are you familiar with that, that there, there was an oral culture and that they were really good at remembering things based on how they shared them? You know, like our current culture, the best thing I can tell you is jingles. You know, jingles in our culture, we can probably quote various jingles. What's a jingle that you know from like when you were a kid that we would all know? My baloney has a first name. It's O-S-E-A-R. That's the oral culture that we have inherited. That's what the Gospels, how the Gospels can tell the exact same thing. Because do you have that written down somewhere or you just know it? My baloney has a second name. It's M-A-Y-E-R. And if you ask me every day, why I'll say, because Oscar Mayer has a way with B-O-L-O-G-N-A. Yeah, right? I, I, but that's it. We know it. We know jingles. That's, that's how Matthew and Luke could have had a teaching and have it word for word. Because those things were floating around. And, and does that help you understand what, I'm, what the book is saying? About how they have similarities that Mark doesn't have? And how could they be exact? That's exactly how they could do it. And they, they wanted to remember them. It was important for them to remember them. That was actually more important and was even more carefully done back in the Old Testament days, which is why M Moses could write times that were before him and write them so accurately. Okay, how does Moses know how God did it? Because there was poetry rolling around in, in Hebrew culture that told the story of how God that God created, and that nothing came to be except that God spoke it into being. And he wrote it in a book so that it would be for you and I to have. Isn't that awesome? That's amazing, I think. And so we've got this vertical and the horizontal. The vertical level's harder. I started with the harder one first. But then I think the, the section that it talked about um, interpreting as a whole, there was a little section on that. I forget exactly um, which page that was. It was like 146, maybe 147, somewhere in there. 146, thank you. The interpreting as a whole. There's three items that I want to draw your attention to, and there are three little words. Do you see them there? Selectivity, arrangement, and adaptation. Selectivity, arrangement. And adaptation. All three of these are basically the axe to grind. That's how the gospel writer develops the axe to grind. The, the message that he wants to relay. And um, the best way to think about this is that all of us, if we were standing on a street corner and witnessed some sort of a happening. Say there was a rear-end accident. No one was hurt, but we all saw it. Okay, maybe some of us were standing on the far corner, some were on this corner over here, some were over here, and some were over here. Maybe someone's in the car itself, and you're telling the story. Each one of us would tell that from a little different perspective. Except that there is the X factor within all of the Gospel writers, which is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that's guiding this process the whole way, right? And so they're selecting particular things, like John selected four instances of Jesus' appearances after the resurrection. He arranged them in a certain pattern to tell you that increasing doubt, Jesus met increasing doubt with increasing evidence and, and, and ministry to first John, then Mary, then to the disciples, then Thomas, right? 
he arranged them, and he's adapting it to his overall story. He's arranging it in a way to tell you, that he, that, to get you where he wants to get you, which is in chapter 20, verse 31, that you may believe. And it's belief that he wants to affect in you. And, and he wants you to encounter the, the, um, the Savior that is fully God and fully man. How you do that is by telling his story. Because I don't know how those work together. I could just read the Gospels and say, wow, that's amazing, look at that. Okay, so I think those three are the, the words to use that help you understand what the acts that I'm talking about. They're using particular stories arranging them in a way and adapting them to tell you a story that's actually true and from their perspective and guided by the Holy Spirit. And it's amazing that God used four Gospels. It's awesome. So that, that, uh, that's kind of the, the uh, exegetical side. The hermeneutical side is, um, that's a tough one, isn't it? And that's where we come to basically the idea of kingdom is already but not yet. The kingdom of God is already but not yet. And the author uses a term, tension, we, ho- we have to keep this tension, where we're enjoying the kingdom of God that is at work in our lives, but we have not yet appreciated the final fulfillment of Jesus' prayer, that the kingdom come and the will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When heaven comes to earth, when the two come together and there's a new heaven and there's a new earth, that's when the kingdom has finally come. But the Bible continually talks, Jesus continually talks to you from his ministry saying, the kingdom is at hand, the kingdom is here, right? Because it is. He's inaugurated it. He's begun it but it won't find its final fulfillment until he returns again. And we get the the trumpet blast. That was a kazoo, I guess, but, (laughs) right? So as we interpret these things, it uses a fancy term called eschatological. And it talks about the eschaton, which just means not yet. We have to keep our eyes, remember I was talking, was it last time I said we need to keep our eyes way down there and it keeps you on course? Just like when you're driving, don't look at the front of your car because you'll be doing this. Look way down there. Because what's here, it's too late anyway. Down there is where you want to know what's coming up. To think eschatologically means you're keeping your eyes on the return of Christ. And there is a final fulfillment that we keep our eyes on as Christians. And we need to think and interpret in terms of that eschatological, long-range view of when Christ returns. All the fancy eschatology just means when Christ comes back. You hear eschatology, just think when Christ comes back. And and that's that's it. I mean, when he returns and heaven and earth come together and we live perfectly, we get new bodies like Jesus and we can move places without cars. Seems like that's what the body did. I mean, he just appeared in their midst and that's a resurrected body, yet it's physical. I don't know. It's pretty cool. I hope I get one like that. You too, I hope you do too. But the hermeneutic, we need to keep in mind that it's all, all about the kingdom of God that is already here, but not yet. Full and fully fulfilled. And that's a tension that we have to keep jumping back and forth. You know? And, and, and any, any questions about that we can handle on the other side of small groups? I took five extra minutes. That's okay. I, you can charge me. So, you guys have, I, I laid out the questions. Everybody get questions? Okay, find your own groups, ready, go. I'm not going to give you any guidance. You can be with who you want to. There are the two classrooms back here. There's the library. There's spots back there. Uh, one or two of you can stay here. But I would say... Be willing to walk and uh, be in a different room if you can. See you back here at quarter till. Quarter till. Get it? Good.
Okay, we're ready to uh, get back together here, and I, I'm ready to field questions. I don't know if I'll have answers, but I, if there are any questions that we have or sticking points that might be the same for everyone. So uh, does anyone have a sticking point they'd want to talk about? Or Yes? The fourth question, and maybe it's... Oh, um, I think those are listed under the, under the uh, nature of the Gospels. Let me... Yeah, it's the many teaching methods utilized by Jesus. Uh, and it, it lists them in rapid succession, I think. Proverbs, yeah, or yep. Poetry, I, that's the best thing I can come up with. So I think um, it's maybe time to talk about books that are listed in here as well. Uh, it, it lists um, a harmony that's different than the one I held up. I like the one that I have better. Uh, the one that's listed on the bottom of 144, Synopsis of the Four Gospels. I think this does a better job than the one that's listed on the bottom of 144. This is the one that I shared in the group. First of all, it uses the NIV. The NIV Harmony of the Gospels. If you go on, the, on our uh, group page and look under resources, there's a link to it, and it's actually from Christian Book Distributors. Notice I didn't say CBD. <laughs> this uh, cheaper uh, through Christian Book Distributors, this book is. Um, they have it on special right now, and I think it's, I can't remember exactly, it's like 14 bucks or something like that right now, and if you're going to be in a Bible study, um, this is the one that I talked early on when, when I found out we were going to be in John, it was before we were officially coming here as a church, and I mentioned this might be one that you want to make available to people to get a hold of because of just how cool studying with this alongside if you're doing a, a Gospels study, to be able to study horizontally uh, better, more effectively, quicker. Um, a lot of our Bibles have, like if you look in the Gospels, it'll list when you're in a pericope, which means a little section of teaching. That's how you say that term, pericope. Um, that, was in our, that was in our chapter this, this uh, last week for the Gospels. Basically what that means is a story that Jesus, a, you know, a teaching that Jesus gives. And um, so you'll see above the pericope or the section, there'll be other areas of the scriptures in the Gospels that that's where that particular story is in Matthew. If you're in, let's say you're in Mark, and it's, um, you know, a story that you're on, it'll tell you the Matthew and Luke if it's there and sometimes John. So the feeding of the 5,000 you'll see all three of the other Gospels, whichever one you're in. Uh, a lot of Bibles have that. But this does it in a way that, uh, I kind of like in reading through it because it, it's chronological too. Like it tries to piece together when that story came within the ministry of Jesus. Somehow that helps me ground Jesus in his story better. Because of my Western brain probably. I like chronology. Yeah, it's terrible, but it's true. <laughs> okay. So I don't know that that's ultimately the answer, Myra, but I think that's the what it's referring to. The six, because there are six key genres that Jesus uses there. And we're going to deal next week with parables specifically. And, and um, I was telling my wife, I think I may be stepping on toes next week because of how tricky parables can be.
because they're not allegories where everything means something. Uh, they're really usually trying to teach one thing. You know, sorry, you don't have to read next week, maybe, no. <laughs> okay. I had a question about the parables, and you know, I'm not going to read into it that you mentioned it. Uh, but there's several spots where the disciples ask Jesus, why do you always teach in parables? Right. Well, that's so nobody will understand what I'm talking about. Yeah. That's basically what he says. Yeah. Except you guys, you know, because I'm going to teach you in private, then it doesn't say what he taught them in private. So Oftentimes he does. But yeah, there are some times where it's like. Yeah, it would, it would defeat his purpose. Uh, yeah. Speaking in parables, if there was a clear. At large, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it also it tends, I think, to to um, to um, in, it's in keeping with he uses the foolishness of this world to confound the wise. There's a lot of that in there too, I think. Uh, so, I don't know. Jesus was a little. I think he had kind of a, sm a smirky smile on his face as he's teaching. Just to, uh, you know. Yeah. Okay, other things uh, from this week. My wife was mentioning that the vertical side of things might still be a little confusing. Is it any clearer or did I just make it muddier? Yeah. Well, that dual level of, of historical contexts and, and this kind of thing right here, the selectivity, the arrangement, and the adaptation uh, is important to keep in mind when you're thinking vertically. Because you've got to say, well, no, why, did, why, did, why did John select these? What is Jesus teaching in here? How do these different vignettes, these pericopes, how do they come together? Why does this come right after that? And sometimes it, the text, like in John, if you notice, it would say, like, this last week, eight days later, we're going to find out this week that Thomas puts his fingers in the side, or maybe he doesn't because the text doesn't actually say that, but that's, that's the interaction with Jesus. Hey, put your fingers in here on my side. Come on. And after that, Thomas is responding, but it, we know it's eight days later, so there's a sequential nature to that, and there's, that's in some of the Gospels, but some of it's not. So... I also thought, did I confuse you about the word order conversation? That Greek doesn't care about word order. And that you can emphasize based on where you put something in the sentence. And uh, sometimes we do that with volume. Your mother says, put your clothes away right now. And sometimes in my house, it would be between gritted teeth. Then you knew she really meant it. Right now. <laughs> Yeah. Why did they say it like that? Okay, I get what they're saying. Yeah. But it's like, why did they do it like that? Now, yeah. now I get it. Particularly if you're reading like the NESB, which is trying to maintain the original word order. That's why it sounds so wooden and jerky and not necessarily English flow. It's because they're trying to maintain that original word order, which can be super helpful. Because then you realize, wait a minute, that must be at the beginning of the sentence. They're trying to uh, emphasize that word, or Paul is, or whatever, which is why I I try to start in the NASB when I'm when I'm studying, just because I want the word order. You know, I mean, it's really good to have that, particularly in the New Testament, because word order matters more so. I mean, that's overstating the case, but the Old Testament Hebrew, they can emphasize in ways like that similarly, but not as much as Greek. So. I don't want to overstate that case. Uh, other questions? I love some of the texts that they recommended. I didn't put them on the, on the resources list, but um, if you want to better understand the way Jesus teaches in those six you know, literary uh, styles or whatever that it asks about, the one book that, that is mentioned in the text um, which uh, I don't remember what page that is listed on, but I have it highlighted so it's easy to find. Um, the Method and Message of 
uh, Jesus' teaching on page 136. That's um, the Stein author. The Stein is the author. Um, I know for a fact that the Goodwill had a copy of this in Rockford that is already on its way to me, sorry. But uh, there were, I think, four or five other, uh, that same price, it was three bucks and something, three dollars to get it. And it was like, I lent that book out to somebody a million years ago and it never came back. And I was like, oh, it's only three dollars. <laughs> so I'm getting it. But because it does such a great job of talking about those different ways that Jesus is teaching, it goes into the very question you asked about why are you teaching in ways that hide your truth? It's um, because you're going to come to Jesus on his terms, not on your terms. It's kind of one of the takeaways that I had for that. Um, why did he... Don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. Wait, this is amazing stuff. What do you mean keep it to myself? Right? Well, it doesn't make any sense until you... I mean, it, it's important. That's, Jesus wasn't going to go public until he was ready and it was the right time. Well, we kind of talked about that. What if he reveals something to you that's kind of a test? You know, I'm going yeah. you know, to tell you this, and then I'll go blabbing around everybody. Yeah. And if that's what you do, that's, you got your revelation then. You know, yeah. That's all you're going to get, but you can't be trusted. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, the, the whole self-righteous thing, too, that Jesus is teaching in the, in the, in the Gospels, you know, he, he was definitely not a fan of Pharisaism even though theologically he was a Pharisee, as far as the height of the law, the importance of the law, the heart of that is Phariseeism. We think so negatively about the Pharisees, but there's really a lot of positives. They, they really wanted the law to be lifted up and to be you know, understood and followed, and it's just they implemented it the wrong way. Theologically, a lot of their, their theology was right. Jesus was in keeping with them, but not in their execution. He wasn't in line with the Sadducees because they're sad, you see. Because they didn't believe in the resurrection. resurrection. Yeah. And then you had, there were three groups that were in the Sanhedrin. There were the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and then there were the Essenes. And you don't really hear them either, but the guy who was on the cross with Jesus that mocks him was probably an Essene because they were zealots. They carried knives around and, and uh, you know, tried to make trouble for the Romans with knives. <laughs> which is why he was on the cross, probably, because he was a bad guy. Um, that's free. I'm not going to charge. Uh, so there, there's, a lots of, uh, there's lots to be learned from the Gospels, especially when we, when we use the right understanding of it. You know? um, what was it you were asking me last week? The cloth being folded. Oh, yeah. That, you're asking... He, he's, were you... I, that, you know, there's this whole theory about, you know, when, you, when the Gospels, John, we just read it, they see the cloths folded. Yeah. And uh, there's some thinking that that was how a master would indicate that he was coming back to his servants. As if he folded his napkin, then he was coming back. If he crumpled it and left it there, it meant he was done. Yeah. That's conjecture. I don't know that we would ever want to stand on that as a theological point. Yeah. But it sure is interesting. That's why I said, that's why I want to talk to you. Yeah, yep. <laughs> yep. Um, another one that I alluded to on Sunday was that the cup that we celebrate is the third cup of the Passover. There's four cups of wine you drink throughout the course of a Passover meal. And the one that we celebrate as the Eucharist or the communion is the third cup. And Jesus will partake of the fourth cup at the wedding banquet. So, it's pretty cool stuff. Um, how, how much can we stand on that? Uh, I think it's a little stronger than the folded napkin, but uh, still interesting to be thinking about. And that, could Jesus have been that careful? You better believe it. <laughs> he didn't waste a thing whenever he was teaching, by the way. Everything is important. Real quick, a thought came to me a while ago. He's sitting there with his disciples, and he tells them, he would not drink from that cup again until, you know, so 
from in heaven or something like mm -hmm. that. Does this go with what, what you guys were t just talking about? Yeah, I mean, he's, that, he, in, he instructs, he institutes the Passover uh, celebration until he returns. But then what he's saying is, I won't drink this fourth cup until I come back. The wedding, are we talking about the wedding too? Yes. Get some tingles, brother. Because <laughs> that's the Holy Spirit at work, I think. I mean, that's him saying... Yeah, we're going we're gonna to celebrate when he has that final cup. Yeah. Yeah, and there were four cups, and they all had meaning and all of that. And on the fly, I can't remember what the third and the fourth cup differences were, but it's, you can look it up. Well, it's so specific. I won't drink from this cup again until I drink it from it in the kingdom. Right, which means the wedding banquet in the kingdom when the heaven and earth come together. Yeah, you can infer that. It doesn't say it specifically. Yeah. It's, it's hard to not do that, but yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> and this is why you spend thousands of dollars on a seminary education, so that you can have trivia, <laughs> Bible trivia discussions. But I think that's all just faith. In I mean, that just builds my faith. And uh, I hope it does yours. And that, that you would not be the one, this is where I want to finish, in Matthew 7 that we read at the beginning that none of you are the one who say, Lord, Lord, but that your, your heart is truly captured and remade by Jesus so that he will say to you, not who are you, but well done, good and faithful servant. And part of my wanting to do this class is to prepare other well done, good and faithful servants so that we are doing the work of Jesus while we are drawing breath. So... I will see you next week. Here ends the class. I think we're right at 8 o'clock. Oh, 802, two extra minutes. Yes? If only there was a book we could give out. Oh, jeez, thank you. <laughs> we have another free book. It, this is um, Living the 66 Books of the Bible. It does a little bit of introduction to every book of the Bible. This is one that came in that our friend uh, brought in and first come, first serve, because there's only one of them. If you want it, it's right here, ready, go. David Jeremiah. David Jeremiah. I looked through it. It is, it's David Jeremiah. So, uh, pretty solid stuff. And you know, I was just looking at Zechariah. I'm like, I wonder what he does with Zechariah. He says, Hey, read this book before you read Revelation, because they're going to sound very similar, which is true. He quotes a bunch of Zechariah in in uh, Revelation, and all the weird stuff in Revelation is really just quotes from the Old Testament. There's nothing new there. He's just saying, look, this is fulfillment of that prophecy, like in Daniel and, and Haggai even, and uh, just all over the place. So, all right, see you guys next week. And I think it's, is it in three weeks? We don't have class, the Holy Week, 27th, I think, or whatever that date is. That's the, yep, that's the one we don't meet. We're taking a week off. You can catch up on your reading. <laughs>